Oh, good morning, everyone. I want to get started a little early here just to get some of the logistics out of the way. Uh, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm a field crops educator down in the southwest part of the state. I'll be your host for today. Just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, first of all, if you would like to um, ask any questions of either of the presenters for today, uh, really, or any of our specialists, uh, the, the chat box is open. Please go ahead and put in your questions into the chat box. We'll be addressing those throughout the morning. Um, even though it's a live meeting and you are able to unmute, uh, we'd like to ask if you could mute yourself uh, during the presentation, uh, during the Q&A at the very end, if you really would like to, to open up your mic, um, you can do that. But uh, during the presentations, uh, please keep yourself muted. That'd be great. If you joined and you notice that your your name is not in the participants list, if, if you're coming up with something else, especially if you'd like to uh, request credits, uh, we'd ask that you would go in and uh, rename yourself and the description of how to do that is on the screen there. And for those of you who are going to be requesting uh, either CCA or RUP credits, uh, we'll be taking care of that at 7.30 after the presentations. Uh, this diagram on the right hand side, you've probably seen this before, this is really our way of saying that everything that we do with MSU is, is open to the public. Uh, the collection of demographic data from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of Michigan State University Extension programming. I've had folks ask, well, why is it that you always ask so many of these questions? And that's why, because our uh, some of our, our federal funding uh, sponsors have, have required that we collect this information. Uh, it's voluntary. The information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you, uh, but rather as a member of a group, so it's all aggregated. And a link is going to be put into the chat box. Uh, we'd ask that uh, if you could do that. Uh, if you feel comfortable doing that, just take a minute to fill out that demographic information. We'd appreciate that. So last year, we asked our participants about evaluations. We like to evaluate our programs because we want to, number one, make sure that we're, we're hitting everything that, that our audience is, is really wanting us to. We also want to make things better. And so we asked them how often they would like to, uh, to be evaluated or to, to evaluate our programs. And, and they said, well, you know, not every week, but you know, kind of periodically, maybe once a month. And so we'd like to do that this morning. We'd like to give you the opportunity to give your feedback. And so we'll be putting a link to a separate, so this is not the, the link that we just talked about, but a link to this evaluation, again, just to give us some feedback about this morning and about the virtual breakfast in general. And then uh, we'll also put that in the chat after the presentations as well. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, we'd also appreciate that. All right, and with that, I am going to get out of the way. We've got a special guest here from Ohio State University, Dr. Kelly Tillman. She's going to be talking about slug management. So Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and you are good to go. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank everybody for the invitation to be here today. It's really fun to be able to speak to a new audience, uh, audience just up the road, but one I don't interact with as much, so I'm really uh, happy to be here with you guys today. So I am going to share my screen. Okay, are you guys getting the uh, title slide here? Does that look good? Okay, good. Gr great. So um, I've been at Ohio State University as the uh, field crop uh, state specialist for five, going on six years now. Before that, I worked at South Dakota State University also as a field crop specialist. And in South Dakota, slugs were never on our radar screen. I, I think in 10 years of working there, I got one slug call one year then, and that was it. But then when I came to Ohio, all of a sudden, um, this became um, a big part of the problems that, that my growers are facing. And um, 
Normally, if I were doing this talk uh, out loud, I would ask you to sing out the answer to this, but I, everyone's muted, so I just want you to sing out the answer in your head. What is the number one thing that you think of, the first thing that pops into your head when someone says slug? What is the number one thing about slugs? And I bet, if you're like most of my audiences, the answer is slimy. Yes, slugs are slimy. And uh, they're soft-bodied creatures that uh, don't have a hard shell or exoskeleton like insects, and uh, they protect themselves from the environment by maintaining a, a moist uh, barrier, a slimy, moist barrier. So they are moisture-loving creatures. And so they live in habitats that are not only moist, but protected from temperature extremes. Uh, that don't experience a lot of disturbance and where the, the temperatures are moderated. And all of these conditions uh, describe cover crop agriculture and no-till agriculture. And these are the types of farming situations where we most often see the worst slug problems. Uh, we have that nice crop residue, keeping things moist, moderating the soil temperature, in the spring, we have that early cover of vegetation, with, which provides not just food, but protection. You can have slug problems in uh, regular conventional tillage, non-cover crop, but by and large, most of the severe problems are in these types of habitats. So I'm gonna keep this brief today uh, in the interest of uh, time, but uh, if there's anything you want more detail about, please, please just ask me and we can go into more detail. So just a little bit briefly about slug biology and damage. Uh, slugs can damage, they're very generalist in their habits. They can eat lots of different things, uh, lots of different plants, including weeds, but also different field crops. These are some damage pictures uh, feeding in corn and soybean, but also um, alfalfa, canola. They can also do damage in small grains, but really the, the most, um, calls that I get, the most problems I see are in corn and soybean early in the season. And this is a picture of a field, for those of you who are on the phone and don't have the video, this is a corn field where a large percentage of the corn field has been taken out early season uh, by slugs, and we have a large bare area there. And this is an aerial shot of a farmer that I work with of slug damage from soybean. And you can see that maybe up to half of the field has been taken out by slug damage in this location. So it's a real problem for some people. Uh, it's always worth knowing a little bit about the life cycle so you can understand management. Slugs uh, start out as eggs. They're little kind of clear pearly eggs that they lay in the soil. And the gray garden slug is the most common species that we have in field crops in this area. There are some species, other species you'll run across, but most of what you'll find in your fields are gray garden slugs. They can lay up to 500 eggs per year. Uh, those eggs hatch into juveniles, so little baby slugs, and you can see that they're smaller than a dime. And then they grow into adults, and the adults can live more than one year. So an adult can lay eggs more than one year in a row, uh, helping populations to build up. And these generations overlap to some extent. It's not like with some insects where the, the stages of the life cycle are pretty regimented. You can have slug eggs in the fall, you can have juveniles in the fall, but for the most part, most eggs are laid in the spring. And then that means that we have juveniles uh, which start uh, being prominent in the field crops in April and May. And juveniles are growing slugs, so they're very hungry. They eat a lot. And so you can see we have a problem when we have hungry growing slugs and the smallest seedling plants where they can do the most damage. So that's why we tend to see the worst crop damage in April, early May as the plants are smallest. We actually do have slug feeding going on um, at the end of the season. It's just not a big deal because the plants are big enough to take it. So I'm gonna briefly breeze through uh, some elements of slug management. The first is always awareness and scouting. Now slugs are nocturnal. You're not gonna see them during the day. You may see the slide slime trail on the plants if you're looking carefully, but if you actually wanna catch them in the act, you gotta go out after dusk with your flashlight 
and look around and then you will find them uh, on the plants actively eating. And that's the, really the best way to assess the population. Go out after dusk with your flashlight, take a look around and that'll give you an idea of the magnitude of your problem. If uh, you don't wanna do that, you can monitor passively during the day. And uh, we recommend you put out something like a shingle or boards about a square foot on the soil surface in your field and check underneath those boards let's say mid morning, because uh, during the day slugs will look for a protected place to hole up and stay out of the direct sunlight. And so put up your boards and check them regularly. To, and then that'll give you a sense of when the numbers are increasing. And it's much cooler under these shingles or boards. And we've done studies, you'll see on the left, that's a, a temperature uh, heat gun that we use to monitor the temperature under the soil and some of the experiments we've done on different types of traps. So this monitoring, uh, I'm sad to say, is not gonna give you a threshold because we unfortunately don't have slug thresholds in field crops. There just hasn't been enough research done on it. So the best you can really do is be aware of when the populations are on the rise, when you're starting to get juveniles, when you're starting to see more slugs under your monitoring devices and base your decision on the history of that field and on your experience with the creatures. And that field history is important because field, slugs don't tend to just show up overnight. They don't like, you know, blow in on a storm. They don't move super far. And so if you have a slug problem in a field, chances are they've been there a long time and they've been building up slowly. So field history is important. And keep in mind also that uh, the younger your plants are combined with heavier feedings when you're gonna have the greatest damage potential. So take all of these factors into effect when you're deciding if you need to uh, jump in with a rescue treatment. Now, there are not many rescue treatments available. The uh, most common and uh, best is the uh, molluscicide baits. So slugs are mollusks. Uh, they are not insects. Insecticides don't kill them. But there are a few different baits uh, that are designed to kill slugs. So a little bit about these baits. Uh, as the name suggests, baits, they have to be ingested. Uh, the most common uh, type of active ingredient in these baits is a chemical called metaldehyde, and this is the active ingredient in Deadline MP. Also, there's a product called Metarex. I think Deadline is the one people are most familiar with. Uh, there are also iron phosphate uh, products, uh, Slogo and Ferox or two, and these don't work quite as well as metaldehyde, but they are organic approved, so that might be an option for organic. Now, these have to be ingested, uh, so they have to be distributed broadly, and the slugs have to actually come up and eat them. They're formulated to be attractive to slugs. The drawbacks of them is that they can be expensive. For example, I think a treatment of deadline runs maybe approximately $20 an acre, given, um, given what kind of a deal you have with your supplier. Also, these, these baits dissolve when they're wet, so you need to be careful not to put them down right after or right before rains. Try to pick a dry period of time. Uh, metaldehyde is approved for broadcast in corn and soybean. Um, this is something not everyone realizes. They are uh, labeled at different rates, and I don't know why. People ask me, why are they different rates in corn and soybean? I, I don't know, but in corn, they are, um, it's labeled for 25 pounds an acre, and in soybeans, it's only labeled for, for 10 pounds an acre. So how well does it work? Well, it works better than nothing. It work, can work pretty well, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not like this is going to eliminate a raging slug population. It will bring it down, and you may have to do this a few seasons in a row if you really want to uh, take a slug population um, to near zero. And you're never going to get rid of them entirely, but it's taken years for that slug population to build up to the point where it's a problem for you. And it'll probably take a few years to bring it down to the point where it's, it's a non-issue for you. But they do work. It can work. This is a study that my predecessor in this position, Ron Hammond, did where he did a, a slug study with distributing bait um, and then uh, control plots where there was um, no bait. And uh, you can see there's a lot more corn missing 
in the lower picture where there was no bait distributed and the corn is doing a lot better in the upper picture where the bait was distributed. So yes, it can work. After you've done an application, you want to figure out, um, did it work? And the best way to do that is to look at the new vegetation. Um, you can go out after dusk, uh, look for slugs after you've treated, see if you're seeing them, and look for plant growth, um, new plant growth. And if the new plant growth uh, is undamaged, so in, in this plant, here in the bottom, you have a lot of ratty looking leaves, but you'll see that the newest trifoliates are undamaged, suggesting that you did a good job with your distribution and control. Tillage can help if you can bear to do some light tillage. Uh, this is slug damage in a field with a lot of residue. And then in the same field, the other side of the field, after some light tillage, uh, removing that residue, you can see uh, the corn is in much better shape. Uh, another piece of advice, plant early. You want to get those plants as far ahead of the slugs as you can. So the most vulnerable plants are the little seedling plants. And if you can get them an early start, then when the slugs wake up and start getting hungry, there's um, more plant and less uh, opportunity for them to take the plants out entirely. Uh, there are some other approaches. Uh, people ask me about putting nitrogen solution down. This is sort of a you know ad hoc solution. Um, it's not easy to pull off. There has been one um, scientific study showing it can reduce slug populations, but it's not easy. And uh, you have to go by the rule of three. 30% nitrogen, which is one gallon of urea to one gallon of water, 3 a.m., three nights in a row. Why is it so hard? Because this stuff has to touch the slugs. That's why you have to do it at night when they're out and about. And you have to hit them three times to really make a difference. Uh, and you have to beware this rate actually can be cause toxicity, to, especially to soybean plants. So I'm not sure I actually recommend this approach. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. But the one study I do have from um, a fellow named Galen Dively at the University of Maryland shows uh, some significant slug reduction if you are willing to go the distance on this. Now, this is a really interesting piece of new research by John, Dr. John Tooker at Penn State University. He has found that neonicotin, neonicotinoid seed treatments, so insecticidal seed treatments, products like Cruiser, actually can make slug problems worse. Now, why would this be? Well, we have to consider the slug food chain here. We have plants, crops, weeds, the slugs eat all of these things. We have these different species of slugs feeding on the plants. Now, if these plants come up out of the ground with insecticide in their system from the insecticidal seed treatment, won't hurt the slugs, they're not insects, uh, they don't like this toxin in them though, and they will excrete it in their slime and it'll come out on their body surface. Now along come the most important predators of slugs, which are ground beetles. Ground beetles are the lions of no-till fields. This is an immature on the up, up, upper picture, an immature ground beetle, and on the bottom is a mature ground beetle. They eat lots of slugs. What comes along, they come along to this slug that's in, uh, excreted this insecticide in its slime and they eat it and lo and behold, what happens? Let's see if I can make my little movie work here. So this is a normal frisky ground beetle, lots of energy. This is after you feed that ground beetle, a slug that's been feeding on a seed treated plant. And that's it for our beetle. So under other approaches, I would list avoid using a neonic seed treatment, an insecticidal seed treatment, if you don't need that product for a specific pest. Now, I'm not saying avoid your fungicide seed treatments. Um, those are things that some people just really can't skip. But um, if you try, and talk to your dealer, you may be able to get seeds without the insecticide component of that seed treatment. So that's what I've got for you today. I've kind of skimmed over a lot, but I'm happy to take your questions. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. That was uh, actually pretty interesting for slugs. <laughs> so we've got a handful of questions, uh, some really interesting ones. Uh, most of them are about slugs. So Kelly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start directing these towards you. Um, Greg asks, do these feed on roots as well, or is it only foliage? 
That's a really good question. And before I dive into that, I just want to bring up a really important point that um, Cristofanzo has pointed out, which I wasn't aware of uh, for Michigan participants. Actually, the deadline uh, mini pellets in Michigan are not labeled for soybean. They are labeled for corn, but not soybean. Uh, don't no, know no, why. And I can't explain why. There's no, no I have no idea. Don't know, but that's <laughs> and, an and important. Kelly, you wouldn't have even known. <laughs> well, I should have checked, but it never oh. even occurred to me. However, the, uh, the sluggo, the iron phosphate baits are labeled for soy in Michigan. Yep. So I just wanted to get that out there before dealing with some more um, specific questions. So the root question, that's a really good question. They can feed on roots and seeds, but that is only really gonna happen if the seed trench ha is um, still open. So if the seed trench hasn't closed, what they've got is a nice little buffet line where they can get in the bottom of that seed trench and then work along and they'll eat seeds and any roots that are coming out of the seeds. If the seed trench has closed and the plant has come up and it's growing, they're not gonna go underground to feed on the roots like uh, they would with a, um, like a grub would, for example. Uh, another question, the next question after that was, does the damage look like? So I'm gonna share my screen again if I could. And, see if I can find a good shot of what that feeding looks like. Looks a little bit different depending on the type of plant. And in corn, you're more likely to see a sort of a tattered look. They're gonna feed in long narrow strips between the tough leaf veins of the corn. So you're gonna have long um, sort of what looks like tear in the corn leaves. Whereas in soybean and softer leaf things, you're gonna see more of a hole type feeding that would look typically more like you would expect of an insect feeding or uh, for example, bean leaf beetle. Um, and here's a few examples where you can see these holes in the, um, in the leaves. And if you're looking carefully, you can also sometimes see a slime trail that they've left. This would be a bit of a shiny film uh, that you might see uh, uh, that they tracked across the leaf. Uh, let's see. Do slugs have their own pests? For example, birds, yes. Uh, birds, less so because slugs are nocturnal. They're more likely to be fed on by things that um, are out there at night. Uh, for example, if you have rodents out there or uh, raccoons, anything that eats insects is also gonna eat slugs. But probably the most important predators of slugs in field crops are those ground beetles uh, that I was talking about. And there have been studies that show that the more ground beetles you have, the better biological control the, the, of the slugs you get. Uh, let's see, I've heard at other meetings that the insecticide seed treatments used will reduce the beneficial insects, that would be the ground beetles. If we are not using an insecticide on the seed, how long will it take for the beneficials to increase? Well, it's not gonna be an overnight, um, it's going to be have to be a strategy that you commit to for a few years in a row before you really bring that population down. It took a while for that population to come up. So you've got to wait for a couple of things. You've got to wait for the ground beetle population to recover itself, and then they have to have the opportunity to bring the slug population down. So you're probably looking at a couple, three seasons of committing to this strategy before you're going to see uh, long-term results. But uh, and places where they've done this, they have seen good results from eliminating insecticidal seed treatments. Uh, could you please review the organic options again? Sure. Uh, probably the best product and the only one I know that's labeled for organic is the iron phosphate bait. Uh, that would be, goes by, there are a couple different brand names. Let's see if I can bring that up. So uh, Sluggo and Ferox are two uh, brand names of iron phosphate baits. Uh, there was a question later about the relative um, efficacy of iron phosphate versus metaldehyde. Uh, I have not done those trials myself, but good old Ron Hammond, my predecessor who did a lot of work on slugs in his career, told me that on average, iron phosphate maybe is two-thirds as good as metaldehyde. So certainly it's, it's maybe it's not the top product, but it's definitely better than, than nothing. Uh, other 
things that you can do in organic situations are some of those cultural controls I mentioned. Um, plant early and try to get the um, plants a, a head start against the slugs. Weed control is also important. Slugs will eat weeds. So if they're um, early in the season, if the only thing there is in the field is weeds, that provides a nice little bridge uh, for them to eat before the crop is up and helps keep the population he he healthy. So try to do that weed control. Uh, if you uh, can bear, if you're a hardcore no-tiller, but you can bear to do a little light vertical tillage to remove some of that residue, that's going to help you a little bit. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. You showed the picture of 50% damaged field. What did that grower do with that field? Well, that was a um, long-term no-till field uh, where the slug population had been... Um, growing for a long time and uh, that grower ended up replanting. Um, that was soybean, so fortunately he had a little bit more window to replant. And um, uh, I've been working with him in that field to test out different sampling approaches because he does have such a slug population. And so he's been trying some of these things that I've been mentioning and um, we started working with him um, a couple years ago. So I've been watching that field with great interest to see if, you know, by using these approaches, we can bring that slug population down. How deep of a tillage is needed to control? Um, well, the most important thing is if you can um, get rid of that, that heavy residue on top uh, that provides them with moisture and protection, that's, that's the thing to do. So no deeper than you have to do to achieve that objective. Uh, any experience with milky spore? If I remember incorrectly, it is a parasitic bacteria. You know, um, the only experience I've had with that is actually in my lab when we've been trying to get a slug colony going in our lab uh, to work with and do experiments in the lab. And every time we try, we get, uh, we get this um, disease that takes out our whole colony, but I have no experience with it in, uh, for use in the field. Uh, have I missed any questions? I've been kind of skimming through the list here. I may have missed something. Oh, you have done a great job. Uh, you've hit all of them so far. Uh, I have one. It says, do garden beetles eat garden plants? Do garden beetles eat garden plants? Um, there are, uh, what you might be referring to is Asiatic garden beetle, which is a, an emerging pest of uh, field crops in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, but they've actually been in this country for a hundred years. And when they first came to this country, they weren't known at all as pests of grubs feeding on the roots. They were known as adult beetles feeding on horticultural and ornamental plants. So yes, I would say Asiatic garden beetle adults will definitely feed on your garden plants. Okay. All right. So I don't have any other questions so far. So everyone go ahead and we've still got time. Go ahead and put your questions into the chat box. Um, Jeff, I've got one for you. So you talked about the, the, the medium term outlook looking a little bit either warmer or at least close to normal. Are you seeing anything in, in these upper air patterns you like to talk about that is going to show um, a freeze event still for the season? Well, uh, certainly the possibility is there for, for overnight Friday into Saturday morning. Uh, beyond that, it's, it's, it's difficult at this point. Uh, and, and the predictability for, of these events is, is really limited, I think, is, is probably everybody appreciates, especially we, we go out in the forecast beyond several days. But right now, I would say the, the closest thing to it would be, would be the Saturday morning. Uh, but that said, we also have to think about the climatology and the calendar. And for significant portions of the state, especially in the southwest and the southeast, uh, we are getting close to what is typically the end of, of that threat risk. For the northern part of the state, especially interior sections, and then for the upper peninsula away from uh, the lake, we've still got several more weeks of uh, at least the risk uh, looking at climatology. But we are, for the southwest and southeast, we're getting close now to, to what typically is the end of the season for, for frost freezes. That's, and I guess, an important thing to keep in the back of your mind. But do remember last year we had uh, 
he had a hard freeze the second week of May. Uh, so certainly it does happen into the middle of May, but the, I guess the remi remi reminder is that that's definitely more the exception than the rule. And right now, given the, the forecast and, and looking at that, there isn't anything there that would really suggest we've got another big Arctic outbreak like we had last week. But that's, that's what we will certainly hear and what the meteorologists will really be watching for is that pattern. And, and the last thing uh, I, I did mention, one of the models does suggest a pretty cold potential or a potential return to a cold pattern uh, during the end of the first week in May. It, the other forecast models though do not agree with that. So we'll, we'll be watching that. So it's still, it's still there, but the, the probabilities after Saturday especially are, are really decreasing at this point. Uh, Dan asks, is there any chance that the rain event that you talked about for next week, uh, that that might push to the south, uh, similar to other recent systems? Well, we certainly saw that here over the last 48 hours. Uh, and right now, I would say there's certainly always a possibility because of, of again, that, that's four or five days out. But but right now, the, the guidance has been pretty consistent. We should have, the Gulf of Mexico should be open. There should be a lot of water vapor for the system to work with. Uh, it's possible, but I, I, I'm, I think it's pretty likely though that we will see probably more, certainly more precipitation than, than what we have seen here over the last, the last one to two days. So uh, yes, it is, it's always possible to, to see a swing and miss with the, with the forecast, but it's, it's, not, it's not very likely I think at this point. Okay, thanks. Uh, this question might be for Chris. Uh, what are the possibilities of having an early outbreak of alfalfa weevil this year? So it is not early right now based on degree days. If you looked at Jeff's map, uh, the so southwest part of the state was over 200 degree days. And that uh, about 200 degree days is right when you start to think about beetles being active. They're at a, a, a base 48 instead of base 50. So if you go into the Mon site, you put base 48 in. And like I'm looking at the East Lansing uh, thing and I'm at 233. So there's already adult activity out here. It's not early. It's actually right on time. Um, so yes, this would be the time, especially in the lower, let's say third of the state. I'm thinking of I'm trying to imagine Jeff's map there, where if you're over 200, then that's uh, the type of thing to get out there and and start looking. Um, I don't think that they'd be egg laying yet. That might be another, uh, let's say about 300 degree days. So right now it's adult activity for the most part and probably some feeding. Okay. Um, Paul notes that uh, he has caught a few army worm and black cutworm moths in his traps up in Isabella. Um, this past week, I have not, I've caught zero um, black cutworm down in the south, south central, southwest corner, and a couple of what I'm going to call lookalikes for army worms. So I'm just going to say this past week has been uh, double zeros for us down here. Uh, Kim says light alfalfa weevil activity is indeed occurring in East Lansing. So that's already going mm -hmm. on. Um, also, it's just a follow up from last week. Uh, last week's virtual breakfast was just on the heels of that that hard freeze. And so we were recommending waiting a week or so to do some scouting. Um, <clears throat> so I'll kind of open the floor up. Uh, I did not see uh, really any uh, damage down in the Southwest, South Central area, maybe just pretty minor to alfalfa, but I really haven't seen any injury to our wheat. Uh, anyone else want to share in different parts of the state what you've been seeing? Eric, uh, this is Paul. I we didn't have any problems with our wheat, but we had some oats fields that got the tops nipped off pretty good. They, from the road, they look pretty bad, but if you go in there, they just got the upper leaves and I think they're gonna be fine. Eric, I haven't seen much uh, damage in the thumb area on the wheat. I think it looks pretty strong. And I would say that it was minimal as far as the damage on that frost and, and really cold weather, so. That's what I've seen. Okay. All good. And again, just like any other week, folks, if you have questions about other topics, we've got other specialists who are on, so feel free to put other kinds of questions into the chat as well. 
Uh, I am not seeing any other questions at this point. Uh, any of the other specialists have anything that they wanted to share with the audience this morning? All right, not seeing any more questions or any other comments. Um, I want to thank Kelly uh, once again for coming in, sharing about uh, what turns out to be a really interesting topic. A number of people uh, apparently have, have had issues with slugs, and so it's much appreciated. And Jeff, thanks again always for your updates. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.